The Advent wreath is a circle with no beginning and no end. It is a symbol of endless love and faithfulness. Out of darkness, light shines, pointing us in hope to the one who came to overcome the darkness of this world and to be our light in the world to come, becoming love in human form in Jesus. Two weeks ago, we lit the hope candle and remembered the promise that the light shines in the darkness. Last week, we lit the peace candle, a symbol of the promise of the coming Prince of Peace. The third candle is called the love candle. Three candles burning bright, chasing away the darkness from light. Three candles glowing bright, the blessing of God giving new sight. Here are these words from Psalms 146. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. He is the maker of the heaven and the earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow. And he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations, praise the Lord. Please join us in prayer. Dear God, we acknowledge your care and love for us. We acknowledge that our help is in you, the maker of heaven and earth, our maker and our remaker through the life and death of the one born in Bethlehem. Through faith in him, grant us the ability to put love into action, to lift up those who are bowed down, to watch over the foreigner, to sustain the fatherless and the widow. Amen. On December 1, 1955, after a long day of work, Rosa Parks boarded a bus in Montgomery, Alabama. A few stops later, she was asked to move to give up her seat, and she refused to do so, even though it would have been the easy thing to do. Civil rights activists had been working for some time to reform the segregated bus system in Montgomery, Alabama, and after Rosa Parks' arrest, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and other spiritual leaders called for a one-day boycott of the bus system. After 90% of the black community refused to ride the bus on December 5, the leaders voted to carry on the boycott beyond, and for a year, they walked and organized taxis for one another. In that year, they faced many difficulties. The home of Dr. King was bombed. Many were arrested. And throughout, the easy thing to do would have been to call off the boycotts. But again and again, they persisted. And in the end, it was a significant victory in the ongoing journey towards justice. And while today we commemorate and celebrate the actions of Rosa Parks, at the time the silence of white Christian churches spoke volumes. Dr. King, Rosa Parks, and so many others knew that doing the right thing also meant taking the long and difficult path towards the way things ought to be. I think we all want the world to be a better place. Christmas makes that so clear to us. We, we desire for the world to be made right, and, it, and the birth of Jesus shines light into the darkness. And yet we are all too aware that things aren't yet the way they're supposed to be, that things still need to be made better. And it's, I feel like that's especially true this year. There's, there's brokenness all around us. We see it. We know it. We want it to be fixed. We want the world to be made right. And so this week we hear a promise about Jesus that many of us have heard many times over and over, right? If we've spent much time in the church, you don't even have to spend much time in the church to hear this word Emmanuel, uh, that, that God with us promise, promise. But this beautiful promise should speak to the desire to see the world made right, to see justice lived out and enacted in our world. And I believe that also this promise, Emmanuel, what we are going to see today is that it should also challenge us and invite us to be a part of fixing what's broken. So we're going to step back into Matthew chapter 1, where we meet Joseph. 
Now, there's so little that we know about Joseph. We know that he's engaged to be married to Mary, but we know frustratingly little about him. And there's been lots and lots of sermons about Joseph, lots of articles about him, lots of questions raised. Was he an older man? Maybe he was a widower who's getting remarried. Uh, Was he young and only recently finished his carpentry apprenticeship and he's stepping into the world with youthful energy and a bride-to-be? We don't know. Here's what we do know, right? What we do know is that when we meet Joseph, he finds out that his bride-to-be is pregnant and he's not the father. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 22, the obligation upon Joseph is that Mary is supposed to be stoned to death, right? This isn't just sort of uh, he can do what he wants. This is actually the law. She has been found to be pregnant outside of marriage, and this is what Deuteronomy chapter 22 has said is supposed to happen. But in Matthew chapter 1 verse 19, this is what we read about Joseph, and I'm going to use the 2011 NIV translation. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Now it's interesting because in the two halves of this sentence, Joseph, how he's functioning and behaving in these two halves of the sentence, they're actually at odds with each other. Hence why the 2011 translation says, and yet. Right? Older translations say he was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to disgrace. But righteous in that time, in the, in the audience of Matthew, they would have understood righteous to mean uh, following the religious law faithfully. And so this presents Joseph with a crisis of conscience. If he obeys the letter of the law, well, Mary's going to be put to death. So what does he do? Well, Joseph has in mind to quietly call off the engagement. Now, at this time in history, Joseph will be completely absolved of all guilt and shame. He can walk away completely. Mary will soon be, if she's not already visibly pregnant, she will carry all the stigma. If anything, this will probably make Joseph uh, more desirable a better marriage candidate, because others will look at him and see someone who was kind and gracious, but also faithful to God's law. They would look at him and see someone who, well, he he saw trouble and he got away from it before it it was too late, right? They're going to look at Joseph and they're going to see Joseph as somebody who's wise and discerning. They're, They're going to see Joseph as somebody who's going to make a fine husband, right? Joseph has every good reason, every advantage, every earthly reason to simply call off the marriage and walk away. But then Joseph has a dream. Uh, Verse 20, after Joseph had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And then in verses 22 and verses 23, Matthew looks back on the situation, and with Jesus-shaped hindsight, says this, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Well, this brings us back to Isaiah chapter 7, which is where that promise that the virgin will conceive and give birth to us, and that's where that comes from. So let's jump back, let's dive back to Isaiah chapter 7, and let's look at what's happening in Isaiah chapter 7. This is the time of King Ahaz of Judah. Uh, We might remember that uh, at this point in history, the kingdom of Israel has been split into a northern half known as Israel and a southern half known as Judah. And the northern kingdom, Israel, has made an alliance with Aram or Syria, and they're, and they're going to besiege Jerusalem to try to pressure uh, the southern kingdom, Judah, uh, King Ahaz, to try to pressure Ju- uh, Judah into a larger coalition allied against the threat of Assyria. Assyria is a growing empire. They are the cutting-edge technology of the day. They are the global superpower. And the kingdoms of Israel and Syria, they are intent on removing Ahaz as king to make this alliance happen if they need to. They are besieging Jerusalem in order to put political pressure on them, in order to try to get him to ally with them against Assyria. 
And in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 7, we hear this. Yet this is what the sovereign Lord says. It will not take place. It will not happen. Right? A promise that God says, you're not going to fall. I am going to deliver you. I am going to, uh, this is going to come to an end. And then God gives this invitation to Ahaz in verse 11. Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. Oh, you know, I would love to be in Ahaz's position, right? Wouldn't you? I mean, God is giving him, him an opportunity. Ask for anything, whatever sign you want. I mean, how often haven't I been there where I just am trying to figure out what God's will is, trying to discern something, and, and I want a sign. And I, man, what an invitation here in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 11. Ask for a sign. God extends this amazing invitation to Ahaz. But Ahaz says in verse 12, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Now, here's the thing about verse 12 that's so amazing. This response of Ahaz, it has the appearance of, of good, upright, religious piety. Right? He's actually quoting from the Bible. This is, he's chapter versing it. This is Deuteronomy chapter 6, 14. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Ahaz knows his scripture. Right? He knows his scripture. He knows that he's, that he's not supposed to put God to the test. Now, the difference is God is actually inviting him to ask for a sign. But Ahaz responds with sort of biblical knowledge, with religious knowledge to say, oh, no, 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 I can't do that. He knows his scripture, but his heart isn't in the right place. And so God says in verse 14, I'm going to give you a sign myself. This will be a sign to you. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Ahaz puts on the appearance of religiosity, but, but we know that his heart is actually somewhere else because this is what, what 2 Kings chapter 16 records this same sequence of events. And this is what we find out in 2 Kings chapter 16 verse 7. Ahaz sent messengers to say to tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, I am your servant and vassal. Come up and save me out of the hand of the king of Aram and the king of Israel, Aram being Assyria or Damascus, uh, the king of Aram and the king of Israel who are attacking me. Right? The real reason he doesn't want to name a sign is that he's actually made up his mind to, to join forces with Assyria against Israel and, uh, against Israel and Damascus. He doesn't want to name a sign because, well, that would force him to ally himself with, with Yahweh, with God, right? Because if he names a sign and God offers him the sign, well, well now his hand has sort of been forced and he has to uh, recognize the truth of what God has been saying. But instead, he trusts in Assyria. He trusts in the people who are the growing threat. And he sort of looks for political expediency. He sort of looks down the pipeline and he says, someday Assyria is going to conquer us all. So I might as well get on their good side now. He has, he has no intention of changing his mind. He doesn't want a sign from God. Ahaz shows superficial knowledge of the law he shows religiosity, but in reality, he has a heart that actually isn't interested in following God's will at all. He's chosen to follow the easy path instead of the right path. And he even does so with, with sort of religious bona fides. Right? He, he wraps himself up in spiritual language. He wraps himself up in scripture. He, he can point precisely to a chapter and verse to say, no, 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 I can't do that. But in reality, he's choosing the easy path instead of the right path. And this is the context of the promise that, we, that many of us know so well, that he will be called Emmanuel, God with us. So we go back to the story of Joseph, and we realize that Joseph is, in some ways, he's another Ahaz. Right? Here we have someone who is knowledgeable in the law and knowledgeable in what the word says. He knows what's supposed to be done. But unlike Ahaz, his heart is in the right response. All right, God tells Ahaz to give him a sign and, and Ahaz responds with, with religiosity and that, that hides the fact that he's actually choosing the, right, the, the easy path. God tells Joseph to take Mary home, and instead of choosing the easy path, Joseph chooses 
the right path, God's way. We remember that Mary and Joseph, at this time in history, this is a highly patriarchal society. In, in many ways, Mary is being transferred from her father's house, from her father's care, from her father's reputation, into Joseph's. His reputation is tied up with her. Her shame is his shame. Nothing about this, taking Mary as his wife, nothing about this will be seen as, as gracious. Nothing about this will be seen as, as, as doing the right thing. In other words, Emmanuel, God with us, it also meant Joseph with Mary. God with us means Joseph with Mary. Now, on one level today, I want us to know that Jesus is God with us. Right? That God has entered into the hurt and brokenness of the world and is restoring and fixing it through Jesus. Right? There's this beautiful, divine, human dance of redemption. God doesn't need us. God can fix what's broken in the world all entirely on God's own. But, but God invites us into partnership to be a part of this beautiful work of redemption. But being a part of that beautiful work of redemption, responding to what God is doing us, means that we can know chapter and verse. We can know scripture. We can know the story of God and yet somehow miss the beautiful work that God is doing. It means that we can know all sorts of things about God and yet never really see or know God with us. And friends, one of the most important messages that we can proclaim loudly and boldly in this Christmas season, in this time in which the world recognizes so readily and easily how this just isn't the way it's supposed to be, we can say Jesus is right here with us. I'm reminded of a conversation I once had with a, chap, with a colleague at, the, at Michigan State University. And she was from a different uh, denomination of Christianity. And, and we were talking about uh, theology. And she said, you know, for her, the heart of the gospel was the message of God entering into our brokenness. It was Emmanuel. That was the center of the gospel for her. That was sort of the, the most important part of the gospel, that God entered into our brokenness, that God walks amongst us, that that. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And friends, right now, whatever we are struggling with, whatever we are going through, however we are wrestling with uh, the things big and small that are happening right now, I want us to know that God is with us through Jesus Christ. And my hope and my prayer is that that gives us strength. It sustains us. It gives us hope. It gives us peace. It can even give us joy when it feels like there's not much joy in the world. But God with us also meant Joseph with Mary. And being Joseph with Mary means choosing the right path, not the easy path. It means being an ally of those who are facing injustice. It means speaking up and lending our voice to those who are whose voice otherwise wouldn't be heard. And often it means getting out of the way so that their voice can be heard. It, it means if, if we are those who, who function from a place of privilege in society, it, it often means simply stopping talking long enough to listen to the voice of someone else. Sometimes it means entering into the brokenness and hard things and hurt and pain. Sometimes it means listening to the stories of, of what others have gone through and acknowledging that, that my perspective isn't the end-all and be-all of this world. I read a story this week of a, a, a monastery uh, back, uh, you know, a thousand years ago. And this monastery had begun to, uh, to dwindle. Its numbers had begun to dwindle. Its influence and its role in the community had begun to dwindle. And people weren't really uh, listening to them and people didn't really see the point of this monastery. And the, the, uh, the abbot of this monastery 
went and searched for answers. How do we bring revitalization to this community? And he went and he spoke to a, a, a really wise individual. And this wise individual said, well, well the Messiah is among you. And this, uh, this, this abbot went back to the monastery and, and said, hey, I've been told the Messiah is among us. I don't know who the Messiah is, but the Messiah is among us. And suddenly it began to transform how this abbey interacted with itself and how it interacted with the community. Because everywhere they went, everyone they interacted with within the walls, they, they began to wonder, could this be the Messiah? Could this person be the Messiah? Could this cook in the kitchen be the Messiah? Could this person scrubbing the floors be the Messiah? And they began to listen to one another more. They began to respect one another more. They began to treat one another as if they were the promised Messiah. And it began to show in the community as a whole, too. Because instead of trying to simply close off the doors, they, they became focused on how can we better serve one another? How can we better be a place that shows that the Messiah is among us. Now the good news of the story of Scripture is that, friends, the Messiah is among us. Because Jesus, God with us, is the promised Messiah, the promised Emmanuel. Jesus, the promised Messiah, he gives us his Holy Spirit who dwells within us such that the, the presence of Jesus Christ is within each and every single one of us. Friends, the Messiah is among us. And the Messiah is among those with whom we disagree. And the Messiah is among those who are trying to work out what it means to follow Jesus Christ. And when we begin to see one another as living embodiments of the Holy Spirit, it means that what we strive to do first and foremost is to defend one another. We strive to get out of the way of one another. We strive to listen to one another. But the reality is that's not always going to be easy. It might mean that as we do so, it might mean that we face challenges and trials. It might mean that as we walk beside and as we ally ourselves with those who are mistreated, with those who are victims of injustice, it's not always going to be popular, but it's right. God with us also means Joseph with Mary. And so the invitation this Advent season, on a day in which we remember the promise of love, is to choose the right path, even if it's not the easy one. Amen. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, give us courage to choose the right path. Give us the ability to listen well to each other. Help us to see those voices of the oppressed, those who are victims of injustice, those who have been excluded. Help us to listen. Help us to be allies. Help us to be Joseph with Mary, as you are God with us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
friends, receive God's blessing. May God go before you to guide you. May God go beside you to befriend you, beneath you to support you, and behind you to protect you. Do not fear. God is with you. Emmanuel, God is with us. Do not be afraid. Amen. Thanks for joining us. Have a great week.